So in chapter six, Lenin addresses a very practical, tactical question about working within unions with reactionary or non-revolutionary leaderships. Lenin begins the chapter with an interesting exploration of the role of Russian trade unions, their relationship to the Communist Party, and the role trade unions play in the overall functioning of the dictatorship of the proletariat in the new Soviet Republic, what was then the new Soviet Republic. Remember, he's writing in 1920. Lenin outlines the leadership of the communists and the party in the Soviet unions, while making it clear that the trade unions are non-party, where the majority of members were not communists, even after a successful revolution. The Soviet trade unions were mass organizations of the working class, which are led by communists. Lenin outlines this relationship because he sees it as an essential component of the working class rule in Russia, in addition to the Soviet, or, uh, you know, Soviet comes from the term workers' council, so in, in, in addition to the workers' council system of government um, that he also highlights. So Lenin is raising the Bolsheviks' trade union experience here as a correct orient, uh, orientation in contrast to uh, the people that he's arguing against, which is the German lefts or the German leftists. Like uh, this is, again, this came up in the first section, but it's uh, a left wing, what would become a split from the newly emerging Communist Party in Germany. Um, and the German lefts have mixed up the role of the party as a vanguard organization and the role of trade unions as a mass organization. Lenin contrasts his position with the German lefts who think that, these are Lenin, Lenin's words describing the German left position, that communists cannot and should not work in reactionary trade unions, that it is permissible to turn down such work, that it is necessary to withdraw from the trade unions and create a brand new immaculate workers union invented by very pleasant and probably for the most part, very youthful communists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, trade unions, and this is still the, the quote, trade unions are and will long remain indis indispensable school of communism and a preparatory school that trains proletarians to exercise their dictatorship uh, in, an, an, in a, an indispensable organization of the workers for gradual transfer of the management of the whole economic life of the country to the working class. So that was, um, you know, the first part was Lenin talking about the German left position. And the latter part was why um, trade unions remain important mass as mass organizations. Lenin succinctly outlines the important role trade unions have while recognizing their real limitations. Many trade unions in Canada are dominated by leaderships that exhibit the characteristics that Lenin describes as a certain narrow-minded, uh, a certain a certain craft, sorry, what does he use here? I think I need to change slides. Uh, economists, maybe? Or yeah, he's, he's talking about similar concepts. He doesn't use uh, economism as, a, as, a, as something he's arguing against here, um, but he's definitely talking about similar ideas. So here, yeah, now we're on the right spot, on the right slide, this will help. So many in the trade union uh, in Canada are dominated by leaderships that exhibit the characteristics that Lenin describes as a certain craft narrow-mindedness, a certain tendency to be non-political, a certain inertness. Today, we use slightly different terms to describe the same phenomena, such as business unionism, uh, when right-wing union leaderships reject union-led independent political action. Uh, business unionism is only interested in the narrow economic self-interest of the particular union, and is opposed to, often opposed to uh, social unionism or class struggle unionism. Those are two slightly different things that we can talk about later if we want to. Um, but at the same time, even reformist-led unions can be an indispensable school of communism. Even the most right-wing unions in Canada can be forced to take strike actions and can never fully divorce themselves from the class struggle entirely, even if that is what some leaders try and do. It is our duty as communists to play a vanguard role in trade unions to defeat this kind of leadership that attempts to keep labor movements docile. It is the necessary role of unions in the class struggle that allows them to serve as schools of communism, but they cannot replace the necessary role of a communist party uh, as a revolutionary political vanguard. The ultra left today, in particular, some anarcho syndicalists and Maoists uh, argue that today's unions in North America are too reactionary to work in or with. 
It is true that, that a majority of the labor movement in Canada today and the US is led by right-wing social re reformists in no small part due to imperialism's attack on the left during the Cold War, you know, the expulsion of all the communists from leadership in, in a lot of the trade union movement. On the whole, we would agree that there are major subjective problems in the leadership of the trade union movement. After all, the Canadian Labour Congress has been openly calling for Labour's collabor collaboration with business and the government. Uh, this is a right-wing strategy called tripartism. Uh, even, they even went so far as to endorse Bill Morneau, the ex-finance minister and super wealthy capitalist to be the next OECD general secretary last fall. The AFL-CIO, which is the trade union center in the US uh, to which the international unions in Canada also belong is directly connected to imperialist institution and acts of aggression against sovereignty and peace of the peoples of the world throughout the 20th century and right into this century. The 20th century is also demonstrates that the social democratic leaderships of these unions, for example, NDP co-founder David Lewis, father of um, Stephen Lewis and many others were more than happy to collaborate with right-wing forces and state spy agencies to purge the labor movement of communists. This is all true, but it was also true in Lenin's day. And it did not shake Lenin's determination that communists needed to work in reactionary unions. The 1920s were a very reactionary period for trade, union, trade unions in Canada, uh, which were still dominated by craft unionism at the time. Lenin noted that in advanced imperialist countries, the right wing was even more established in the labor movement than it had been in Russia. He argued that this did not matter and the strategy should be the same in these countries as it had been in Russia. The basic truth remained that trade unions needed to be mass organizations and that if their membership was limited to revolutionaries, that they would fail in their necessary role of fighting back against the bosses. Um, so I'll just quickly read a Lenin quote here because this is it in a nutshell. We're waging a struggle against the labor aristocracy in the name of the masses of of the workers and in order to win them over to our side. We are waging a struggle against the opportunists and social chauvinist leaders in order to win the working class over to our side. It would be absurd to forget this most elementary and most self-evident truth. Yet it is with this very absurdity that the German left communists per perpetuate when, because of the reactionary and counter-revolutionary character of the trade union top leadership, they jump to the conclusion that we must withdraw from the trade unions, refuse to work with them, and create new and artificial forms of labor organization." End quote. Lenin continues to argue forcefully against secessionism, which is a tactic advocating that revolutionaries should secede from existing trade unions and form revolutionary trade unions. The problem with ideas such as these is an overemphasis on subjective problems, for example, trade union leaders being the main or only problem, um, and confusion between the role of a revolutionary vanguard party and the mass labor party, uh, the, the mass labor movement. We've been over that a little bit. If trade unions are too limited to those that agree with on the need for revolutionary socialism at the current moment, then the organized fight back of the working class will be very narrow, and these trade unions will fail in bringing the organized masses into struggle against the capitalist class. Lenin writes that in the early 1920s, not unlike today's situation, that the majority of workers were just beginning to get organized. And you know, the majority of the private sector especially is unorganized in Canada, even worse in the US. Our own party, the Communist Party of Canada, struggled against secessionism at its founding. The uh, IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, and the One Big Union, which was uh, similar to the IWW, it was, it was active around the, the Winnipeg General Strike in Western Canada, uh, were influenced by, they, both of these organizations were influenced by anarcho-syndicalist ideas. While many leading members of the IWW joined the CPC, such as Sam Scarlett or Arthur Slim, Slim Evans, which are names that come up in our history in the 1930s leading strikes, um, the IWW and the LPU as a whole tried to unite uh, you know, some there were just some discussions about uniting into the CPC, but those ultimately failed. And Tim Buck outlines this ideological struggle in his book, uh, 30 Years, when he describes the debate inside the uh, Communist Party at the time uh, in 1922. And he points to Lenin's left-wing communism, this book in particular, as being important 
to building the party's unity at that time. The Communist Party of Canada has refined this general strategy towards the organized labor movement throughout the decades and in changing circumstances. It has always fought for a united movement, even through the years of the Workers' Unity League, which was the communist-led trade union federation formed to combat craft unionism that existed in Canada from 1930 to 1935, uh, eventually encouraging its members to join and build the uh, CIO, that's the Congress of Industrial Unions, um, and however, the unity that is necessary cannot be built by allowing class collaboration to lead. Real unity can only be built through class struggle by a sovereign and independent trade union movement. So we'll quickly look at the CPC program here on, on the next two slides. Um, and it outlines what we fight for in terms of organization and ideology in the labor movement in, in more detail. It says, to combat the power of big business and the transnationals, the trade union movement must become sovereign, independent, and united with the highest level of coordinated strategy and action. A sovereign trade union movement is one whose affiliates are Canadian or Quebec unions, or in the case of US-based international, quote unquote, international unions, because they're really only US and Canada, they're not too international, um, whose members in Canada, so in the case of US-based international unions, whose members in Canada have autonomy and control over their affairs, including independent political action. Canadian autonomy is a step on the way to achieving full sovereignty. So that takes care of the, the sovereign trading movement that we fight for. Now we move on to independent. What does independent mean? Independence means freedom from the control of employers. Sovereignty and independence are the conditions for a truly united and militant trade union movement governed by the principle, an injury to one is an injury to all at all times placing the interests of the movement as a whole above the sectional interests of the individual affiliates. It must oppose rating and resolve jurisdictional disputes in the interest of affected workers and the movement as a whole. Um, and then we get to, I think, some of the main parts that reflect what Lennon was talking about. Uh, to win the trade union movement for such a fighting program, Right-wing policies of class collaboration and betrayal of labor's interests must be challenged and replaced with policies of consistent class struggle. The struggle against opportunism, collaboration, competition, and betrayal is an essential fight for the trade for trade union democracy, expansion, survival, and the unity of the working class as a whole. Communists in the trade union movement are historically dedicated to this struggle and work to uphold the best militant trade union principles and maximum democratic involvement in decision making. Here we go. So <laughs> uh, he begins chapter seven, uh, Lenin, Lenin begins chapter seven, um, which is entitled, Should We Participate in Bourgeois Parliament? By dis discussing the claim by German ultra leftists that parliamentary forms of struggle. In 1920, the Soviet system of workers' democracy uh, had replaced the Russian parliament called the Duma, and the state had taken a uh, new form under worker and peasant control. Other Soviets or, or workers' councils had been important organs of, re of revolutionary power in other countries after the war, notably Germany, Hungary, even to a certain extent, you could say what was going on with the Winnipeg general strike. Uh, some evidence that bourgeois democracy had reached its limits was perhaps more available in 1920 than 100 years later. Nevertheless, Lenin did not agree that bourgeois parliamentarianism was going to die in the near future, and it did not. Um, parliament, okay, so let's see. Yeah, so there's a quote from Lenin here. Part of it's up on the screen. Parliamentarianism has become historically obsolete. Lenin's talking about the German left position. That is true in a propaganda sense. However, everybody knows that this is still a far cry from becoming it in practice. Capitalism could have been declared and with full justice to be obsolete many decades. But that does not at all remove the need for a very long and persistent struggle on the basis of capitalism. We must not regard what is obsolete to us as something obsolete to a class, to the masses. 
You must not sink to the level of the masses, to the level of the backward strata of the class. That is incontestable. You must tell them the bitter truth. You are duty bound to call their bourgeois democratic and parliamentary prejudices what they are, prejudices. But at the same time, you must soberly follow the actual state of the class consciousness and preparedness of the entire class, not only of its communist vanguard and of all the working people, not only their advanced elements. Participation in parliamentary elections and in the struggle on the parliamentary rostrum is obligatory on the party of the revolutionary proletariat, specifically for the purpose of educating the backward strata of its own class. Whilst you lack the strength to do away with bourgeois parliaments and every other type of reactionary institution, you must work within them because it is there that you will find workers who are duped by the priests and stultified by the conditions of rural life. Otherwise you risk turning into nothing but windbags. So um, maybe the duped by the priests and stultified by the conditions of rural life aren't exactly applicable to today, but definitely um, you know, the vast majority of working people in Canada still do pay attention and participate in one way or another in elections. Here, Lenin insists that subjective desires by, uh, be ignored and that the communist movement have an honest appraisal of the objective reality. Our tactics must include the parliamentary struggle or else that arena, which the masses still participate in, becomes entirely uncontested. Today, there are still many revolutionaries, quote unquote, that argue that participation in bourgeois, uh, that argue against participation in bourgeois elections. The arguments against participation today are less based on the mistaken belief that Soviet governments are just around the corner, but instead point to the consistent betrayals of social democratic po politicians or politicians in general. Social movementism, rising in popularity during the heights of the anti-globalization movement, uh, tries to answer these betrayals by claiming that parties and parliaments are nothing and movements are everything. There is often a symbiotic relationship between social democratic and parliamentary struggle from the parliamentary struggle. So you'll see kind of social movementism like with a social democratic variety and an anarchist variety. Uh, communists have the broader view that mass struggle largely determines the terrain that parliamentary struggle plays out on. That doesn't mean that we should be deterministic and ignore parliament. Lenin is clear that actions by the masses, a big strike for instance, is more important than parliamentary activities at all times and not only during a revolution or in a revolutionary situation. Those are Lenin's words. However, extra parliamentary mass action does not replace the need for parliamentary struggle. So here we, we get to quote some Canadian Maoists. Um, in the last decade or so in Canada, the Maoist uh, Revolutionary Communist Party has been the most vocal ultra-left critic of the communist participation in elections. Uh, both splinter groups claiming ownership over the RCP share a common program, which states, actually there's more than one splinter group <laughs> um, uh, from the RCP, but two big ones that claim, claim to be its, itself. This is another thing with ultra-leftists that we don't get into in this presentation is they can't get along with themselves and they split off into other groups. Okay, but quoting them, um, quoting their program, and part of it's up on the screen, but it, the first part talks about us. Uh, concerning revisionist organizations, such as those of the Communist Party of Canada, who think that they can wrest power out of the hands of the bourgeoisie and build the proletarian state by using bourgeois institutions, let's say by getting people to vote in a handful of, uh, vote in a handful of communist MPs, the latter allowing, allying themselves with a few socialists and enlightened liberals in order to form a progressive majority in parliament. Well, it's only people can participate the illusion that it is a democratic process but in which they are not able to bring any real change to society. Elections are nothing more than an occasion to choose your favorite blood-sucking oppressors. We revolutionary communists declare, boycott the elections down with bourgeois parliamentarianism. Okay, so we're gonna get into why this is, why we, we do not agree with this. <laughs> Critically flitted, rallied or attended, 
candidates' debates during an election know that workers are more receptive to listening and discussing the political situation at this time. This is because, for better or for worse, millions of working people dial into politics during bourgeois elections at the current time. Our tactical approach is proven correct in every election, despite limited immediate results in the current period. We haven't elected every, anybody to provincial or federal parliament in a number of decades, but we have elected people at the municipal level more recently. It is clear that our approach is consistent with Lenin's strategies and tactics. So although the Revolutionary, calls, Revolutionary Communist Party calls themselves Leninists of some kind, they call themselves Maoists, but anyways, they, they claim that they read Lenin. Len, they, you know, they obviously do not agree with this pamphlet that Lenin wrote. Uh, and what did Lenin write? It is very easy to show one's revolutionary temper merely by hurling abuse at parliamentary opportunism or merely by repudiating participation in parliaments. It's very easy, however, uh, cannot, it's very ease, however, cannot turn this into a solution of a difficult, a very difficult problem. To attempt to circumvent this difficulty by skipping the arduous job of utilizing reactionary parliaments for revolutionary purposes is absolutely childish. You want to create a new society, yet you fear the difficulties involved in forming a good parliamentary group made up of convinced, devoted, and heroic communists in a reactionary parliament. Is that not childish? And I think this makes, this makes sense. I mean, like, you're planning on having a revolution and totally changing the world, and you don't think that you're going to be able to get people elected on, along the way? Like, you, you got to have some strategy on how to participate. Um, for us, it is necessary to, uh, it is a necessary part of the broader struggle to work to form a good parliamentary group made up of convinced, devoted, and heroic communists, in Lenin, Lenin's words. However, it is not our end goal to elect members to a parliament. This is what separates us from social democratic electoralism. So, we participate in bourgeois elections, but we're not electoralists. Social democratic parties, with the NDP being a prime example, often reject discipline from the party towards their parliamentary caucus. While the membership of the party may be allowed to pass progressive policies at conventions of the party, or may not be, It is the leader or caucus present the social democratic fear of the discipline to the leadership of a small number of opportunist leaders who have a material interest in sacrificing anything to maintain parliamentary power. Communists should work in a fundamentally different way inside the same institutions. Uh, later on in Lenin's several conclusions chapter, he comes back to how communists can create an in his words, a new communist type of work while campaigning during this Lenin now in Europe and America. And he separates Western Europe and America out because he thinks that uh, the working class in these countries, which have a, like a longer bourgeois democratic tradition, are more sucked into the, the bourgeois democratic uh, liberal ideas, which still remain the case, I think. Uh, the communists uh, must learn to create a new uncustomary non-opportunist and non-careerist parliamentarianism. The communist parties must issue their slogans, true proletarians with the help of the unorganized and downtrodden poor should distribute leaflets, canvas workers' houses and cottages of the rural proletarians and peasants in the remote villages. Fortunately, there are many times fewer remote villages in Europe than in Russia, <laughs> that's an aside. They should go into the public houses, penetrate into unions, societies and chance gatherings of the common people and speak to people not in learned or very parliamentary language, they should not at all strive to get seats in parliament, but should everywhere try to get people to think and to draw masses into the struggle, to take the bourgeoisie at its word and utilize the machinery it has set up. The elections it has appointed and the appeals it has made to the people, they should try to explain to the people what Bolshevism is, what communism is, in a way that was never possible under bourgeois rule outside of elections times, exclusively, of course, in times of big strikes, 
when in Russia, a similar apparatus for widespread popular agitation worked even more intensively. It is very difficult to do this in Western Europe and extremely difficult in America, but it can and must be done for the objectives of communism cannot be achieved without our effort. And here we got some pictures. So this is um, uh, J.B. Salzburg, the Make the Rich Pace for Diner writing. He was a communist uh, member of provincial parliaments uh, in the 1930s and 40s, I believe. Anyways, definitely in the 40s. Um, Doris Nielsen was elected in the early 40s, uh, the first communist member of parliament um, in Saskatchewan. And um, this is a, 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 a crew outside of a debate at our last, uh, during, during the last federal election. So in chapter eight, Uh, which is called No Compromises, and Chapter 9, which is called Left-Wing Communism, Left Communism in Great Britain. Uh, Lenin applies the Bolsheviks' experience of building political alliances to Great Britain and elsewhere. Lenin attacks an overzealous rejection of compromises in general. Um, and this is, I'm quoting Lenin, of course, to very young and inexperienced revolutionaries, as well as to petty bourgeois revolutionaries of e even very respectable age and great experience, it seems very dangerous, incomprehensible, and wrong to permit compromises. Of course, in politics, where it is sometimes a matter of extremely complex relations, national and international, between classes and parties, very many cases will arise that will be much more difficult than the question of a legitimate compromise in a strike or a treacherous compromise by a strike breaker, treacherous leader, except, et cetera. It will be absurd to formulate, it would be absurd to formulate a general recipe, a recipe or general rule, such as no compromises to suit all cases. One must use one's own brain and be able to find one's bearing in each particular instance. So again, Lenin's arguing against uh, dogmatism, basically. Uh, Communists cannot rely on recipes or cut and dried formulas to determine when a retreat is either necessary or an opportunist mistake, because they can be either. Instead, Lenin demands that we develop caters or leaderships that are able to grapple with complex political problems and point the way forward. Lenin then raises the question of compromises with the other political parties in order to create alliances. He focuses in on the German lefts who write that all compromises with, the, with other parties, any policy of maneuvering and compromise must be emphatically rejected. Lenin returns to the history of the struggle in Russia and a clear-headed understanding of what revolutionaries are up against. And this is uh, the quote that's on the screen, screen there. Uh, to carry on a war for the overthrow of the international bourgeoisie, a war which is a hundred times more difficult, protracted, and complex than the most stubborn of ordinary wars between states, and to renounce in advance any change of tack or any utilization of conflict of interests, even if temporary amongst one's enemies, or any conciliation or compromise with possible allies, even if they are temporary, unstable, vacillating, or conditional allies, is that not ridiculous in the extreme? Uh, Lenin goes on to outline the political alliances of the Bolshevik party. So he talks about um, 1901, 1902, a formal alliance with bourgeois liberals against czarism, um, alliance with the opportunist Menshevik party inside a single social democratic party prior to 1912, and various alliances with petty bourgeois peasant uh, socialist revolutionary party before and after the October Revolution. The SR uh, party was for a short time after the revolution was in an alliance with the Bolsheviks. Um, in each of these alliances, the Bolsheviks maintained relentless ideological and political struggle against the various other political forces inside the working class movement while defending an alliance with the bourgeois Democrats against Tsarism and defending the alliance of the working class and peasantry against bourgeois liberalism and Tsarism. Uh, the general strategy that can be seen here. I mean, we're not we're not defending anything against czarism in Canada, but the general strategy uh, that can be seen here is to isolate and to fight, defeat the right with the broadest possible unity while maintaining ideological independence 
and holding on to the goal of socialism. Lenin is demonstrating here that it is possible to have more than one kind of alliance simultaneously. Communists need to be clear-headed in their thinking around alliances, asking themselves which allies are necessary for which demands. Is this a short-term alliance or a long-term alliance? It should be noted that it is sometimes even necessary for communists to create alliances with sections of the bourgeoisie, as demonstrated by the global struggle against fascism in the 1930s and 40s. However, it would, of course, be a major right opportunist mistake to think that such an alliance is necessary when fascism is not the main enemy. And fascism always is a danger to some extent. So that's where things get, that's where this, there's a debate. Uh, Lenin writes about the necessity of alliances with parties representing other classes. Um, oops. Sorry, I'm just having trouble changing slides with the keyboard. Uh, Lenin writes about the necessity of alliances with parties representing other classes. The petty bourgeois Democrats, this is Lenin speaking, including the Mensheviks, inevitably vacillate between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, between bourgeois democracy and the Soviet system, between reformism and revolutionism, between love for the workers and the fear of the proletarian dictatorship, etc. The communist proper tactics should consist in utilizing these vacillations, not ignoring them. Utilizing them calls for concessions to elements that are turning towards the working class whenever and in the measure that they turn towards the proletariat. Uh, in addition to fighting those who turn towards the bourgeoisie. So paying attention to the divisions that are happening. Um, Lenin's strategy of the utilizing vacillations and offering concessions to elements that are turning towards the working class tells us something about how to approach alliances with social democrats. This is a major question across Canada as the labor movement and many other people's movements are led by social democratic ideology and by social democrats. The CPC's program, and I'll just add there that we're small, we're, we're much smaller than the NDP. So this is a, a very, you know, a, a very important question. Uh, the CPC's program speaks about the necessity for de of defeating social democracy while also recognizing the need to form alliances with social democrats. And here's the program again. Uh, the main political expression of reformist ideology and class collaboration within the labor movement in Canada is social democracy. The history of social democracy in Canada, especially since 1945, is intertwined with vicious anti-communism and class collaboration with aspirations to rule on behalf of capital. That is the fatal flaw of social democracy, and it cannot be rectified by new incarnations of social reformism. For example, the new um, or resurgent democratic socialism, which is also in the, in the program. The right wing leadership of the social democratic movement in Canada and internationally has abandoned the goal of socialism entirely, embraced globalized capitalism and reoriented social democratic parties in favor of the illusion of managing capitalism with a human face. These developments attest to the widening gap between the interests of the working class and those of right-wing social democracy. But, I'm sorry, these are, this is not a, a complete extract of the program. It's, it's, it uh, kind of highlights uh, a lot going on in that section. So it's good to go back and read the section if you haven't read it. Um, in the day-to-day -day struggle, communists work closely with left-wing social democrats and other activists in the labor and progressive movements and strive to develop united action and cooperation. This is in the program still. The Communist Party continues to work for cooperation with the NDP around common issues and reforms, despite the widening gulf between the principles and class allegiances of two parties. In the same way in Quebec, the Communist Party works for cooperation with Quebec Solidaire, a left-wing and pro-independent social democratic party. The more effectively the Communist Party works for left and democratic unity and strengthens its independent political activity, putting forward its Marxist-Leninist program and policies, the more the left forces both within and outside the NDP can be brought into struggle for genuine progressive policies. 
Lenin and the CPC's program recognized the need for alliances between revolutionaries and reformists in non-revolutionary periods in order to advance popular struggles. To reject alliances on principle is sectarian. However, it is true that sacrificing the ideological independence of the Communist Party is opportunist and will lower class consciousness in the long term. And there is a good, um, I don't have time to go into it, but it's in the study guide. Um, I'm not reading out the entirety of the study guide, uh, just sections, but there is a, a section on the study guide about Lenin putting forward uh, what an alliance would look like between communists and the Labour Party in Britain that I think is pretty interesting. Um, if communists adopted the position that all part political parties besides the Communist Party are the same, then it would be impossible to advance any alliances. Communists must understand both the similarities and the differences of parties and the classes or sections of the classes they represent. On the level of pure communism, that's a term that, that Lenin uses, capitalist parties are all the same. However, communists can't stop there, as Lenin writes. This is the quote on the screen. From the standpoint of the practical action by the masses, these differences are most important. To take due account of these differences and to determine the moment when the inevitable conflicts between these friends, which weaken and enfeeble all the friends taken together, will have come to a head, that is the concern. The task of a communist who wants to be not merely a class conscious and convinced propagandist of ideas, but a practical leader of the masses in revolution. So, you know, it might be propagandistically true to say there's no difference between the, the Democrats and the Republicans or the Liberals and the Conservatives. On one level, that's true. They're both parties of big business, but there are differences um, and we need to exploit those. Uh, I mean, you know the differences in our angle and speed. <clears throat> Um, okay, in Canada today, the CPC is not in, uh, in any electoral alliances at the federal level, uh, or the provincial level for that matter. However, uh, many for many decades, the CPC did work to try and enter into an alliance with the CCF and later the NDP. The NDP's anti-communism made this impossible. Um, the Parti Communiste de Québec does have recent experience in helping to found the Union des Forces Progressistes, which was the UFP, a coalition that then became Quebec Solidaire a Quebec party that the PCQ left only three years ago. The CPC has been involved in several municipal reform movements with social de Democrats and others over the years as well. Um, for now, electoral alliances are less frequent than alliances inside the labor and people's movements. These are important to build unity in the working class fight back. The CPC program is clear on its rejection of sectarianism and understands the necessity of unity. Communists strive to strengthen the unity and action of all the labor progressive and democratic forces. The Communist Party seeks cooperation with other organizations in the labor and democratic movements. It promotes the development of broad coalitions, alliances, and united front formations that defend and advance the interests of the working class and social and economic and democratic rights of the Canadian people. Building alliances increases the material strength of the working class and illustrates that the particular oppression that the particular oppression of a group of workers feels is part of the broader pattern of capitalist oppression that affects all working people. It illustrates the relationship of those classes and groups to one another and to the state. It helps working people to respond to other cases of capitalist oppression. It teaches working people to learn how to work with other classes and groups. In other words, it helps to create the basis for working class leadership of society as a whole. At the same time, the CPC maintains its ideological, this is a program still, um, maintains its ideological, political and organizational independence. It explains its program openly among the people putting forward the necessity and timelessness of socialist transformation. It is our main task to build unity and solidarity in the movements where we are active. So this is kind of, this whole approach is having a dialectical, understanding the dialectical relationship between the Communist Party and its independence as a vanguard for the working class, and also the need to build uh, unity beyond that, you know? It's not, it's not just the Communist Party or bust, bust. And with a strong Communist Party comes more ability to build unity. 
Okay, so this is a fun one too, but we won't go ahead to get into it too much because Lennon doesn't talk too, too much about it. But um, Lennon goes on to explain that alliances and compromises are necessary even after a socialist revolution in a country that is building socialism. Keep in mind that the, communist, the Russian Communist Party would advance the new economic policy a year later in 1921, making major concessions to small capital and a free market in order to increase production. The USSR was obviously not the only socialist country that decided it needed to make economic and, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of uh, background noise if, if comrades could mute your mic, um, to make economic and political concessions. Whether these decisions were necessary in order to advance socialism or were unnecessary retreats and are in fact betrayals of socialism need careful and rigorous examination that cannot be done in a study guide. I mean, there've been both, both in, in the history of socialist countries. However, it is safe to say that many ultra left voices today do not examine alliances and compromises by looking at the objective conditions and the balance of class forces, but instead measure socialist societies against the ideal image of socialism in the abstract. In these cases, the ultra left ends up siding, uh, ends up attacking revolutionary governments in the name of revolution often siding with imperialist voices, governments, and organizations. As Lenin writes in chapter six, we can and must begin to build socialism, not with the abstract human material or with human material specially prepared by us, but with the human material bequeathed to us by capitalism. True, it is no easy matter, but no other approach to this task is serious enough to warrant discussion. So basically we're not, we're not building socialism in an ideal world. We gotta, gotta play, play the hand we were dealt. Ultra leftist condemnation of existing socialist countries is intertwined to the tendency to imagine we can ignore necessary democratic transformations and leap over the struggle to build socialism directly into communism. The Communist Party of Canada's adva uh, program advances the building of a democratic anti-monopoly, anti-imperialist alliance that would eventually be able to form a people's government in order to break the stranglehold of finance capital. This would open the door to socialism, but would not constitute socialism itself. Whereas ultra left groups tend to ignore the complicated process of building socialism and see the revolution as something happening in a very short period of time, our program points out that retreats may be necessary depending on the balance of class forces. And I uh, quote from the program again, it cannot be said today through just what stages this historical process will have to pass or that it will involve only advances and no retreats. The pace at which socialist construction can proceed will depend on the democratic will and class struggle of the Canadian workers and people generally and on the strength of the resistance put up by the capitalist exploiters as well as the international context. So our program, you know, kind of tries to walk a thin line between, um, you know, we have to have a road to socialism, but at the same time, you can be overly prescriptive and just become, you know, utopian or idealistic with, with how you think socialist construction is going to happen. It's going to be a straight path. And it's going to fall this specific path. So got to have a, Kind of a balance there. Um, on revolutionary strategy, in chapter 10 of the book, several conclusions, uh, that's the name of the, the, the last chapter, uh, Lenin makes some broad observations about leftism as an obstacle to developing a clear revolutionary strategy. Lenin is arguing that the revolutionary mood of individuals, the readiness of, working of the working class vanguard, or even a revolutionary attitude of the whole working people does not determine a revolutionary political moment alone. When conditions are ripe, when working people do not want to live under capitalism and the capitalists and their state cannot carry on in the old way, then the leadership of a vanguard party is, is a necessity in leading the revolution to victory. So notice there's three things going on there. Working people don't want to live under capitalism. Uh, the capitalists can't carry on in the old way. They are facing a crisis and there's a revolutionary party that's able to, uh, to, take, uh, to, to become the new lead, lead in society. Uh, Lenin insists that it is important to distinguish between revolutionary and non-revolutionary times in order to determine the correct tactics and to be able to lead the working class towards the final revolutionary struggle. Many on the ultra-left 
then and today, do not make any distinctions, uh, any such distinctions, and instead distinguish between different tactics as inherently revolutionary and reformist in all situations. Inexperienced revolutionaries, um, this is Lenin, I think, yeah. Inexperienced revolutionaries often think that legal methods of struggle are opportunist because in this field, think of the Canadian malice on this one, they, they definitely agree with, with the German left, so I think. Um, so legal methods of struggle are opportunists, according to them. In this field, uh, the bourgeoisie has most frequently deceived and duped the workers, particularly in peaceful and non-revolutionary time. While illegal methods of struggle are revolutionary, it is not difficult to be a revolutionary when revolution has already broken out and is in spate, when all people are joining the revolution just because they are carried away, because it is in vogue, and sometimes even from careerist motives. It is far more difficult and far more precious to be revolutionary when the conditions for direct, open, really mass, and really revolutionary struggle do not yet exist. To be able to champion the interests of the revolution by propaganda, agitation, and organization in non-revolutionary bodies, and quite often in downright reactionary bodies in non-revolutionary situation. Uh, among the masses who are incapable of immediately appreciating the need for revolutionary methods of action, to be able to seek, find, and correctly determine the specific path of a particular turn of events that will lead the masses to the real decisive and final revolutionary struggle, which is the main objective of communism in Western Europe and America, America today. So there you go. You're being called uh, precious by Lenin because you're, you're revolutionaries in a non-revolutionary time. It is the role of the communist parties to find the specific path towards socialist revolution in their own countries. Lenin is speaking about the formation of the international communist movement here and the need to go beyond simply a recognition of the need to fight for socialism and the dictatorship of the proletariat, but also the need to develop unity on a common strategy to win and build a particular vision of socialism. Uh, so the winning, according to Lenin, the, the winning of a vanguard to socialism is an important step, but it is insuff insufficient. Uh, this is Lenin. Victory cannot be won with a vanguard alone. To throw only a vanguard into a decisive battle before the entire class, the broad masses have taken up a position either of direct support for the vanguard or at least sympathetic neutrality towards it and of precluding, precluded support for the enemy uh, would be not merely foolish but criminal. This is kind of adventurism. Uh, propaganda and agitation alone are not enough for an entire class. The broad masses of working people, those oppressed by capital, to take such a stand. For that, the masses must have their own political experience. So they need to be brought into struggle and, and build up their own experience. While the first historical objective, that of winning over the class conscious vanguard of the proletariat to the side of Soviet power and the dictatorship of the, pro, of the working class, could not have been reached without a complete ideological and political, political victory over opportunism and social chauvinism, like social democracy. Uh, the second and immediate objective, which consists in being able to lead the masses to a new position, ensuring the victory of the vanguard of the revolution, cannot be reached without the liquidation of left doctrinarianism, doctrinarianism and without a full elimination of its errors. So, end quote. It might be useful to reflect on our experiences building a vanguard party in Canada in the 21st century here. We are celebrating our party's centenary at the end of this month in the midst of a severe capitalist crisis with several different expressions, economic, environmental, social, and health crisis. More and more working people are turning towards socialism as the only system that can replace capitalism. In fact, many of you um, are, are new to uh, the club or, or our applicants. However, there is such much less unity on the question of how to achieve socialism and the strategy and tactics to get there, even among those that are joining or interested in our party. It is absolutely necessary to defeat leftist ideas in order to build unity around the CPC's program inside and well beyond our party. Overcoming leftist mistakes that are being made inside the party and by party members in the labor and people's movements is just as necessary today as it was 100 years ago. 
We must also differentiate between mistakes that are being made because of inexperience or confusion, as opposed to organized ultra left groups who purposely disorganize and disunify and sow confusion. Comradely discussion, criticism and self-criticisms uh, are the tools with which we can build ourselves up to avoid making these mistakes in the future. Uh, we must also have a thorough grasp of these ideas in order to stop the more nefarious organized ultra-left attacks on our movements, which are only gonna increase the, the, the bigger we get um, by both, both, by both the, the right and the left. Obviously we're more, more concerned about the right, but the left, the left criticisms exist too. There are new variations of social democracy to contend with as the 21st century socialism of Latin America and the democratic socialism of the, social, of the Sanders movement. There are also new brands of ultra leftism that are emerging and will emerge and we need to be able to see, through, uh, see them for what they are. Uh, both on the right and the left, these quote unquote new ideologies will be repackaged versions of old opportunism since the essential class nature of capitalism today has not changed. There's not new classes that have, have uh, been born since uh, Lenin's time. A lot has changed, but not entirely new classes. It is the Education Commission's hope that the, the discussion promoted by the study guide, uh, which I hope you've all read, can make a modest contribution towards these ends. Our most decisive task in building the Communist Party of Canada and in, uh, an important task is a conscious effort to strengthen the whole party ideologically through organized theory and education work. However, we cannot let ourselves get lost in internal theoretical discussions without connecting this work to our practical political work among working people and oppressed people from coast to coast on the streets in schools and in workplaces. It is not communists alone that will make revolutions, which means we can't allow ourselves to be isolated. To close, Lenin offers us some humbling but inspirational remarks on the revolution. Oops, right there. So history as a whole, and the uh, history as a whole, and the history of revolutions in particular, is always richer in content, more varied, more multiform, more lively and ingenious than is imagined by even the best parties, the most class conscious vanguards of the most advanced classes. This can be readily be understood because even the finest vanguards express the class consciousness, will, passion, and imagination of tens of thousands. Whereas at moments of great upsurge and the exertion of all human capacities, revolutions are made by the class conscious, will, passion, and imagination of tens of millions spurred on by the most acute struggle of classes. So he's saying communists don't do it alone. Not that communists aren't a, an integral part of the, the the uh, recipe here.